So thanks for joining today's lightning session. Uh, this is this one is focusing on Spira test and how you can turbocharge your test management with Spira test. Now, uh, if you're interested in about our other products like Spira Teams, Spira Plan, or Rapiz, or even Chronodesk, uh, we will be doing we will be doing additional lighting lightning sessions on those products as well. So this is uh, just the Spira test one today, but do keep an eye on our events page or on LinkedIn or other social channels. We will be announcing in the, announcing other lightning sessions uh, in the weeks ahead. Uh, I'd also like to give a shout out as well for our, our InflectraCon conference, which is going to be in April 20th and 21st in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we still have early bird tickets on sale. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about Inflectra or our products or just having a good time, come to InflectraCon. Uh, we've got lots of good speakers. We've got great food. We've got a live band, I believe. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, good excuse to get away from the office and uh, get some new skills. So just a, a shout out for Inflectricon. Now back to Spire Test. So uh, Spire Test is part of the Inflectra suite. And as you know, hopefully Inflectra, our mission is to help you deliver quality software faster with lower risk. And that's what we as a company are about. And if you work with us for a while uh, or you're new to us, I'd always like to quickly show our, talk about our core values as a company, because ultimately, uh, however good a product is, it's only as good as the team behind the product. And uh, our mission as a kind of Fletcher is to create great products with a great team, create a great workplace and have great community. And what that means for you, our customers, is a few things. First of all, uh, we, we've been around since 2006. We've been building the different tools that we have uh, during that period. We're fully invested in building them for the long term. We're not chasing the latest fad. We're not doing things that Wall Street says we should do for the short term. So you can have confidence that if you choose our platform, we will be around to support you uh, in the long term. Uh, we also try and make things easy for you, our customers, with our Just Get It Done motto, whether you're logging a support ticket or dealing with one of our account managers. Our team is here for you. For you. Uh, we try and make it as easy to work with us. Our team is not on commission. They are there to help you. And our whole model is making sure our customers are successful with as little bureaucracy as possible. And of course, with security nowadays, there's probably a bit more bureaucracy than we'd all like. And of course, we do try and create a great workplace and a great community and give back to people uh, along the way. So moving on, though, from uh, the company, the um, Spira test difference is really important to us. Why is Spira test different to other tools in the market? And what do they say? Well, first of all, let me introduce the uh, Spira suite. So Sp uh, Spira test is part of the Spira suite. And today we are talking about Spira test, which is really focused on the QA team, the needs of a QA team doing requirements, testing, bug tracking, uh, managing the QA process. However, we recognize that people are um, as part of agile transformations and quality and quality engineering are moving to a more integrated set of agile processes where testing is not isolated. So we do have the ability to then move to Spira team. Spira team is an, is an sorry, is an application lifecycle wide tool for an entire team. So you can use Spira team to manage your backlogs, manage your requirements, manage your team, manage your scrum boards, Kanban boards. So Spira team is a full suite for an entire agile team. So if you are looking at Spira tests, but you're missing things like boards or tracking of tasks or code management or traceability with the development team, I would seriously look at Spira team. Today we are again focusing on Spira test, but it is part of that whole. And then lastly, Spira plan is the, the top level on the suite. That's our enterprise version that includes includes the ability to do program and portfolio management. It includes the ability to also do risk management as well. And we're adding support for safe and scaled agile this year. Um, so really, if you're looking towards using Spira at scale, I would seriously look at Spira plan. But again, we'll look at Spira test today and hopefully whet your appetite for the other tools as well. Uh, other, other lightning talks we've done are for our automation tool, which is Rapiz. That's our test automation tool for web, GUI, uh, desktop apps, web services, and so on. Um, bear in mind that Spira is designed to be an open platform, so you're not limited to just, to just using our automation tool. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, Chrome Desk is our help desk tool that integrates with Spira, and then Spira Capture is our completely free exploratory testing tool that can be used for capturing uh, exploratory testing sessions and putting the results right into, uh, right into Spira or on a flat file. Uh, so again, we're talking today about Spira test. If you want to see the comparison to the other editions, Spira team and plan, please uh, look at the comparison matrix.
So why would you want to look at Spyro, use Spyro test? Well, the one thing is it is an end-to-end -end QA testing tool. There are various different oops, testing tools out there that can uh, do test management and defect tracking. Spyro test can do the whole thing from requirements tracking, test cases, and defects end-to-end -end in one platform. But one of our company concepts and company philosophies is the idea of harmony. And when I talk about harmony in the context of Spyro test, what I mean is three things. One, we want to create harmony across disciplines. Two, across through simplicity. And three, across ecosystems. So what I mean across disciplines is that there are some really good testing tools out there, but the testers love them, but they don't give management the information they need to make good decisions. There might be really good tools out there that give you great dashboards, beautiful reporting, but the testers can't stand them. And lastly, there might be great tools for developers, sorry, for testers or managers, but the developers don't like them because it gets in their way and makes their life hard. It doesn't integrate with the tools they're using, for example. So back to the idea of harmony, we want to make sure that Spyro test works well for testers who are using it, managers who are viewing it and developers who are interacting with it, whether directly through Spyro Test or through integrations like our Jira plugin or Azure DevOps plugin or GitLab, GitLab or GitHub plugins. Same thing, make, make it seamless for the different communities. And the reason we do that is because we view simplicity as being really important. Your time is valuable. We don't want you to spend months and months setting up a system, setting up custom fields, setting up workflows, doing a lot of customization and configuration just to get value out. We want you to have the most time using the tool, delivering your product, doing the testing and quality management that you need to do and the quality engineering you to do and not for fighting our tool. So we've made Spyrotus as easy to use as possible and knowing that that means you will have more time to do your work and less time messing with our tool. So that's a really important design philosophy we have, we've worked with. And the last piece is, as I mentioned, even though we do have a test automation tool, we integrate with a variety of different automation tools out there. Even though we have a bug tracking feature, we also integrate with Jira. So we want to make sure that you can choose the tools that make sense for you, for your ecosystem. So we make it easy and straightforward to do that. Uh, we also have features for different industries because different people have different needs. And so we've got functionality in there for financial services around Sarbanes-Oxley and traceability. We've got functionality for life sciences around electronic signatures. We've got functionality for the defense and, military and uh, aerospace environment where you have to have test step traceability. And there's others I can mention as well. But those are just some of the examples of special use cases that we have built out in SpiroTest. Uh, specifically, we also have some functionality across these different industries, uh, which we call the regulated industries. Uh, we have traceability from requirements to test the defects. We've got data privacy built in. You can have it on-prem. Many other products are phasing out the on-premise option. With Spyrotest, you can have it on-cloud, on-prem, private cloud, public cloud. It's your choice where you want the data hosted. We also have uh, the ability to generate all your documentation and compliance information from the tool. Uh, we also have, can have built-in electronic signatures and workflows for the most complex regulated industry down to the most agile process. It's really up to you. And it can be done differently for different projects. And as I mentioned, we, because of our harmony concept of having these different tools plugged in together, we can have integration across your entire software value chain. And Spyro does, of course, comply with various different standards to make all this possible. Uh, these are just some of the standards we comply with. Uh, if you've got any specific questions about that, please reach out to one of our account managers after the demonstration today. We also get lots of awards on SpyroTest. You can check us out. Don't take my word for it. Obviously, I work for the company. Uh, we think it's a great tool. Check us out on G2. Check us out on Capterra. Check us out on, I think it used to be called IT Central Station. It's now called PeerSpot. Um, look on Google and Gartner um, Peer Insights. Uh, look on GetApp. Various different places. We're on TrustRadius. Uh, we're reviewed on all these different sites. Please feel free to check out your favorite site and uh, see what people think. And just to recap, one very important piece, we do have all these different integrations with Spira. Uh, we have integrations with IDEs. So again, back to Harmony with developers. They're working in Visual Studio. They're working in Eclipse. They're working in uh, IntelliJ, Visual Studio Code. We integrate with those different IDEs so they can see their information right there in their IDE. Uh, and we integrate with lots of different tools. In fact, uh, over 65, in fact, I think it's 70 plus integrations right now. These are just some examples that we have. And the integrations are all free. And not only are they free, but they're supported by our team. So they really are free because giving an integration that you have to maintain yourself is not free. That's just to, that's just giving you the, the cost of ownership. So all the plugins that we have are developed by the Inflectra. They're managed by us. If you have a support question, it comes to us. It goes to our support team and they'll help you out whether it's a question about the core app or one of the integrations. So we're not just put, giving it out there to you and saying you're on your own. Uh, back to the idea of a great team. You're part of our team. We want to make sure that you're successful. So. 
with that overview, I'm now going to jump into the live application. So let's get out of uh, PowerPoint and let's jump into uh, the, hold on one second, into the live app. Here we go. So this is Spira test right here. And just so you know, this is an out of the box Spira test demonstration instance I signed up for. So I signed up for it uh, yesterday, just before the webinar. I have logged into it. I have um, set my initial preferences of time zone and I set my initial preferences as to which sample did I wanted to see. That's all I have done. Everything else is 100% out of the box, no change. So I'll just refresh it while I was talking. Uh, and so when you come into Spyro Test, when you first come in after you sign up for a trial version, uh, you come to this My Page and the My Page is the home page for an end user. So that's going to show you everything that's assigned to you as the end user. So you'll see down here, we've got the um, assigned requirements. These are any requirements that are assigned to me. We Right now, as the admin lo user logging in, there aren't any. There are test cases that might be assigned to me. These are right here. If there's any defects assigned to me or tests that I've started, you would see them as well. So everything that's assigned to me as an end user is going to be here on this My Page view. Now, the other thing we have in Spira is in the main navigation. If you go here, we have what are called products and we have programs. So products are basically systems we'll be testing. Each system you'll be testing is a product. Oops, I just reloaded it. There we go. Uh, it's a product, uh, and they're part of a program. And in Spyro Test, you can report on a product, or you can roll it up to a program. Now, if you think, well, I've got, I'm a very big company, and I've got lots and lots of projects and systems, and we need more than two levels, well, don't worry. On the Spyro Plan version of this uh, menu, we actually have a third level quarter portfolio. So in case you're wondering, or if you've seen some of the screenshots or videos, you might have seen the portfolios. That's in the Spyro Plan version. But in Spyro Tests, you do get programs and, and products. You can do reporting at the product level and at the program level. So let's look at a product dashboard first to see how that might look. This is a product level dashboard. If I click on the hexagon, it'll bring that up. And the product dashboard includes key information. It's going to include in the general view, which is the sort of default view we have. That mixes a mixture of program, project and uh, testing management. The testing view is a bit more focused on QA. So in the general view, you would see all of the releases and, uh, that are currently active and what's the percentage complete of all the active work. Complete means I've got the requirements and they're fully tested basically. So on this first release, we're about 84% done. The second one, we're about 44% done. But we're over time on the first one. And the second one, we are behind schedule, but we do have time remaining. So it's tracking how much work is planned versus how much work is being completed. If we scroll down here, we can see additional metrics like the requirements test coverage. How many requirements do I have? Have they got test cases? Have they passed? Have they failed? Do we have full coverage? Um, there's also defect metrics that we have right here. How many bugs are being logged? Are they open? Are they closed? We are able to synchronize these in real time with Jira, Azure DevOps, GitHub, GitLab, uh, various different other tools that we integrate with. They can also be different tools on different projects. And if you uh, are curious about that, I actually have another instance of Spire running over here where you actually have different, uh, different tools. We have ADO, GitHub, GitLab, and Jira, all synchronizing real time with those different systems. So it's pretty neat. You can do that. Uh, back here, though, we can also look at things like my requirements uh, incident count, also known as the, like the incident density of a requirement, how many bugs are associated with a single requirement. If, and right now it's pretty even, but imagine that one requirement had, let's say, 100 bugs and the rest were like ones or twos. There's obviously a systemic issue with that feature. We don't want to fix 100 bugs. We should get to the bottom of the problem and fix the root cause. So it helps, it helps surface those kinds of underlying issues. If we go to the testing version of this dashboard, you can see a, a more testing-focused view. We will see the progress of, of test cases over time. You can see the test cumulative count over time. And then again, a lot more test metrics specifically in KPIs on the dashboard. The dashboard is customizable. You can go to the Add button, add items to it. Um, and make it make make the view your own. We do have a program level dashboard. If I go to that, for example, that's going to show you multiple projects grouped together. I'll go to the testing version because that's more, more useful for this, this particular demo. And on that, you can see what is the test coverage of my entire program? How does it compare for each of my three projects, products? And I can go down the bottom and see each of my three products. What's the coverage? What's the status? What's the count? And if I go to a different program, it might look different. So let's go to um, corporate systems, for example. And that would look slightly different like that. So again, you've got different programs. You can have different views of those different programs. 
So that's the dashboards. If we now jump into the product, uh, before we get any further, just to mention, there is also a more focused reporting page where you can see all the graphs and charts for the entire system. Sorry, system being tested, which is the product. You can see graphs and charts. You can see various different graphs. You can pick and choose fields. If I want to track my test cases and see, let me graph my testing status against my per, uh, priority. You can see that. You can get the data out into a grid. Lots of different graphs and charts and reporting options. I'll come back to this later, but I just wanted to show you that we do have more reports and graphs and charts than just the, the built-in dashboards. And you can write your own graphs and charts using our query engine, which is based on SQL. Now, so we, you've seen all this wonderful information. You're like, wow, that looks amazing. I'd love to have that. Where does it come from? Uh, well, that's a great question. So inside of the main artifact menu, that's where you manage the data in the system. And of course, if you do have test cases in other tools, we want to make that easy for you to extract and import into Spira test. So if you go to our add-ons menu and go right here, you will see that we have lots and lots of import tools. First of all, we have Excel and Word and Google Sheets as options. So if you do have requirements in Word documents, you have test cases in spreadsheets or Google Sheets, we can import those in bulk very easily using these free add-ins. If you're using another test management tool, uh, and we'd like you to think about maybe switching because maybe the, the features aren't good, the usability, the price, the performance, lots of good, lots of reasons. You just want better reporting and analytics. Um, then we do have migration tools for some of the ones that we've seen customers migrating from. First of all, HP ALM, Test Director, Quality Center, whatever you call it. A lot of customers are moving from that right now for a variety of reasons. They don't want to use IE 11 because it's not allowed. They don't want to use ActiveX. They want to have a more modern tool, et cetera, cloud-based um, and agile. Or they, they, they find that the, the tools that are in Azure DevOps are not powerful enough. Another option. They uh, are using Jira, but Jira is going to the cloud. They don't want to be on the cloud. Another option there. So again, test rail, practice test, queue test. Uh, if you're not, if you're not happy with the Tricenters tools, exactly. You can migrate from any of these different tools. All of these tools have been tested and have real customers use them. So they're real examples there as well. And those can be used to bring the data into Spira. Now, obviously, if it's a greenfield application, maybe you just write the data directly in the system. And that's what I'll do today. Now, notice on the menus that you'll see things grayed out. You might be like, well, why is there a padlock next to planning board, source code, risks, and tasks? That's because those features are not in Spira test, but they are in Spira team or Spira plan. And if you see that, you can click on the link and it opens up our website and lets you uh, experience that in another instance, a demo instance, to see, wow, we're using Spira test. We love the requirements. We love the test cases. We would like to have a planning board to do some of our Scrum and Kanban planning. How does that look? Click on the link, opens it up. Same thing with the code management and the risks and the tasks. So those features are, are disabled in Spira test, but they are available to preview if you wanted to get an idea. And if you want to upgrade, it is the same system. We just simply upgrade your license and all the features turn on. It's the same data behind the scenes. All right, enough talking. Let's go into the requirements section. So this is how the requirements section would look in Spira test. Uh, requirements are organized in a tree structure. So basically, if you look at this, you can see all of my requirements. Uh, you can see uh, the test coverage for each of them. So if I was to run my mouse down the, the column, you can see there's different test coverage. It will show you what proportion of that requirement has been tested. Has it passed? Has it failed? Has it not been run? Is it blocked? Is it a warning? That lets you see things very visually with the color indications. But of course, some of that's not helpful. You want there's a lot of requirements. You want to just find things. So you can use the filters. So let me find any requirement that's got at least one failure. That would be pretty useful to know. Uh, so, so that would be one failure right there. Uh, maybe I only want the ones that are higher priority, critical priority. So like that. So I can use composite filters to come up with the data that I want to see. When you have a filter that you like, you can go into the filter section. You can save the filter and you can say, well, that's you know, crit P1 uh, failed. Uh, requirements. Hit save. I want to share that, not just for me, make the team use it. And that's now a shared filter. If I reload the page, it will appear here under quick filters at the top right, top left. Um, so you can see right away, these are quick filters that you or your team can use. So very easy to, to do that sort of thing. It works the same way across the test cases and defect module as well. Other things to mention on this page, you can show and hide different columns. You can, so if I wanted, for example, show the component field, easy enough. Maybe I want to hide the author field uh, like that. Uh, you can have custom defined fields. So some of these fields are built in, some are user defined. To add user defined fields to requirements or test cases, you go into the administration section up here on top left, uh, top right, and you go to custom properties and you click on it. And there will, when it, when it loads, those will be your custom properties. And the same thing for test cases. 
So these are my requirements, custom properties like that. To add one is really easy. You click on the add definition, you choose the type, you give it a name, choose the options, hit save, is it rich text or not? And once you've saved it, you go back to the requirements view and you can now see that new field added to the grid. As well as this grid view, sorry, before I move on, uh, there's also some useful tools. You can go into here and do things like create test cases or test sets directly from the requirements. You can export them into different document formats. You can also copy them to other projects in the system, which we call products um, like that. So if you want to reuse requirements, you can send them to other projects. If I click on a requirement, uh, I get a detail page, and that lets me see the details of the requirement. I can see the name of the requirement. I can see uh, the description. I can see any of the standard or built-in fields right here. I can see the tests that relate to it. This particular requirement's got three test cases. Two have passed. One has failed. And that means this requirement is not yet fully tested. Now, bear in mind that uh, those tests could be manual, they could be automated. So any of the automation tools that we integrate with, uh, those can be used and have different tests reporting back into Spira. So you could be using Selenium with Java, you could be using Cypress, you could be using uh, JMeter, you could be using commercial tools whatever, like, like um, UFT or Test Complete or Vanarex or Tosca. All of those are available to be integrated with Spira. Right here is the different plugins that we have. For the different unit test frameworks, we have those as well, like, like JU unit, end unit, um, Perl, uh, Mocha, Unit.js, Jasmine, Jest, PyTest for Python, if you're doing AI stuff. Uh, the one thing we don't have yet is COBOL. We've had a request for it. We're actually going to be adding it, hopefully. So again, as customers come up with things that we don't have, we can add them into the, into the, uh, the add-on list. Okay, so that's some of the testing side, but just to mention as well throughout the application, whether it's a requirement or a test, you can always attach documents to the uh, requirement. Uh, those can be versioned in the, in the document management system that we have built in. If you go to the history tab, you will see the audit change of any of these fields. So if I was to go in here and make a change, hit save, it's going to uh, store that change as a change record in the audit history, which is really, really important. Now, in terms of the uh, associations, that's a very useful feature where you want to see traceability because you have the requirement that we're on. You can see it uh, links to tests, which we've run. This will show you any of the defects that have come out of that testing. Some of those links are automatically created. We call those implicit links or implied links. So, for example, this top one, that was created during a test run. We ran the test, failed the bug, logged the bug. Bug is, I think, still open. It's still open and assigned. But that bug is linked to this requirement because it comes to a test case. So I didn't have to explicitly link it. But there might be developer-led log bugs. Maybe you log it in Jira. It comes into Spira test. Now you want to link it to the source requirement for traceability. You can always then do what's called a direct link by going to the Add button, choosing the type, requirement, or defect, and then link that in to this requirement. And you can choose, is it just a, an association or is there a dependency relation? Uh, and so that's some of the functionality we do have around requirements. Now, I will mention requirements in Spiritus is relatively limited compared to what we do have in Spira Team and Spira Plan. So you can do requirements management. It doesn't have the board views, the mind map views, the document views, the baselining. It has the basic functionality. So if you're looking for more advanced requirements management than Spira Test, you might want to consider Spira Team. Uh, another thing we do have that's very important is release tracking. You can track all the releases. You can track what's the completion, what's the test coverage. So that way you can see, is this testing on track for that particular version of the system? You can track it at the release level. You can also drill down to a sprint or phase level. If sprint if you're doing agile, phase level if you're doing more of a waterfall project. And we do support uh, all methodologies. We are methodology agnostic. All right, moving now into test cases, which is one of the, the big uh, building blocks of the system. So in Spira Test, we do have uh, the test cases. So for example, we go in here, uh, test cases are organized by folder. So let's go ahead and let me clear my filters like that. And let's look at a functional test folder. So I've got common test, functional test, regression tests. These are my test cases. Uh, we've got five test cases in this folder. If I want to drag and drop one to another folder, I can just simply pick it up and drag it. So I put that one in the regression folder. It's that easy. Let's say I want to create a new test case. So how would we do that? Click on new test case. Easy enough. And again, you can import from Excel or Word or other tools. So let's go ahead and uh, create a new test case that is reporting on the book system. So we're going to do a, quick, a test case to report on something. That's functional test. We've got different types of tests. Those can all be customized. That's good. Click on the option right there. 
Okay, so this is our new test case. You can navigate between this test case and the existing ones or other folders right here on the left hand side. Let's go ahead though and let's um, write the test case. So it's got a name already. We need a description. Okay, well, what, what should we say? Well, this test case, this tests that the system will let you log in and create a report of all books loaned out loaned out in the library and maybe you want to have some preconditions now you could create a separate text field for preconditions that some people do that or you can just use the main text box and use the fact that we have rich text formatting to make this uh inline styles it's up to you really what you prefer I'll just save that uh, I also noticed, notice that it's got a suspect flag. The suspect flag is automatically set if the test has been impacted by a requirements change. Uh, this particular test is not linked to requirements. We probably should link it. So let's go ahead and link it. I don't know if we have an exact requirement that's, that we need. Pretend there's a requirement here that is um, the same thing. The nearest one maybe is this one. It's not exactly the same, but pretend it is. Uh, so we'll hit save. We've now said that this test case supports that requirement. And it's a many to many relationship. One test case may be linked to many requirements. One requirement may, be, may have many test cases, and that's pretty normal. Uh, let's go ahead and add some steps to it. We do have the option to create a default step. You can turn that off if you don't like it. So let's go and you should reuse that one to start with, which would be um, click on a link, click on link to create a report. The report home page appears. So that's okay the next step we'll just do a couple of steps because i know it's a demo we, we haven't got too much time uh click on, so enter in enter in the report uh, date range and click submit the report you enter selected is displayed so that's how easy and maybe you want some sample data in here so we can do that we can even parameterize it so the test set which we're going to get to can send the data through let's create a test parameter we'll call it um start date that's one parameter end date is the next add that and then we want to put that into the test case so the tester can see it whoops let me do that again over here go here and i want bullets for that Uh, where's bullets? Oh, I don't see bullets. Um, I'm blind today. So let me just do it. Oh, there you go. Did bullets for me. Perfect. Um, so uh, it will be start date like that. Insert a cursor. Boom. End date. Insert a cursor. Boom. Hit save. Hit save. I've now got a test case with two steps and uh, expected result, actual result, and some nice parameterized sample data. Okay, now the question is uh, how I log in. I haven't logged into the system. Now, what I could do, I could go in here and say insert step, and I could uh, type in, click on the login button, enter the login, enter the password. Every other test case we have actually already has that. If you look on it, we're already logging in. So we don't require you to create the same step over and over again. You've got two different options. One is you can click on this checkbox and say import a test case. So we could import some common test. If we import like the login test case, it's going to copy all these steps into my test case. That's really good, except if that login page was to change, I have to then update every single test case that I imported it into. Much better in this example would be, let's have a link. So if I use the link option, which is another alternative, I can basically include that as a reusable link. And I can then say, uh, login with um, Firefox and operating system. Uh, I don't need that right now. Password is, oh, sorry, that's the browser. Firef login is librarian, password is librarian, Hit like that. And now I'm reusing that test case and I'm linking in and passing specific data to use. So that's how you can use a reusable test case and include it in your main test case. If we go down the bottom, you'll notice we have got an automation section. That's when we, will, we, we are integrating with automated testing tools. I'm not going to be covering that particularly in this demo. And when I do my lightning talk on rupees, um, which I've done already, but I'll be doing it hopefully in a week or two in the future, then we'll cover that. Uh, we also may do some future webinars on integrating other automation tools. Uh, there is one I did a few years ago on integrating a Tosca. Feel free to look at that as well. But in general, that's where you integrate the automation side of things. For manual testing, you don't need that. And that's my test case created. I'm done. 
Uh, I could go through the workflow and have it officially approved and re reviewed. That's up to you. Some clients will have a system set up where you can only run tests if it's been approved. You can do that in the workflow. You set that, that restriction. In this particular project, that's not set up, so we don't need to worry about that. Now then, we've got a test case. I could run that test case and be done with it. But in reality, if you're a test manager, managing test cases one by one is a lot of work. Because if you go back to the test case view for one second, imagine I've got not just... 16 test cases, but I have 1600 test cases. And I don't have like four tests, I have 400 testers. Very quickly, it's going to be a pain in the neck to be updating at this test case, that test case. Everyone gets an email every time they're assigned to you. That's a lot of work. And it's a lot of emails. Much, much, much better is to use test sets. So in test sets, what we're going to do is put together a group of tests that we're going to assign to someone. So let's pretend I'm the tester. I'm going to create a new test set and we'll call it um, you know, manual suite for release 1.0. And I'm going to choose release 1.0. I'm not, I'll assign it in a minute. Let, let me just create it first. Oh, let me click on that. And there's a typo. As you can see, whoops, it marked as red. Manual. Uh, that's fine. So, and maybe I want a description. This tests the general happy path of creating a book, author, and running a report. So it's an end-to-end -end test set. Hit save. So now I'm going to add my tests. Go in here, add my tests. I go to functional tests. I'm going to grab the author the creation, the book creation, and my new report test. Hit save. And if you look at this test, this is the order I would do it in. And actually, it doesn't make sense. I would create the author before the book because the book uses the author. There is a dependency. So I'm going to just change the order. That's better. And I'll create a report. So now I've got three tests. So now rather than assigning you know, one test at a time, I can assign this whole set to the tester, which will be me, sysadmin. I uh, run it by, by Friday. And maybe I've got a comment. Uh, you know, please do as soon as possible. And I can also add parameter values. Let me hit save first. And then the other thing I could also do is if I want to set some values, I could override them here. I could say, well, I want you to do this whole test across all the tests in Chrome, not in Firefox. Or maybe I do it in Firefox, whatever it is. Hit save. And uh, I can also override particular tests if you want to have different parameter values for different tests. So maybe I go show parameters. Uh, I'm going to be logging in as maybe one user in all the first two tests, but I want to log in as a different user in the third test because it's a reporting functionality. So maybe in here I say log in as admin instead of logging in as the librarian user, whatever it is. You can therefore have test data at the test set level and at the test case level. And if you want to go really crazy, there's a third option, which is you can even link this test set to a data grid of tests and it will run through that entire data grid. So for example, if I want to run these three tests through every possible browser combination, I don't have to create multiple test sets. I can go over here to test configurations, create a data grid. This is an example of one we've already set up ahead of time. And it's 12 different combinations of login, browser, and operating system. And you can now associate the test set with this and it will automatically generate test runs for all of them. So. Another, another option as well. But for right now, just because just it's a demo, I'm going to run the one test set with the one permutation set. So to do that, I go back to my My page. I would have gotten an email about this. Uh, if I go to this play button, I can launch my test. And I'm now going to run my tests. So it's this, it's this easy. Go here, choose the release. It's already chosen because it was chosen the test set. In the test set, I didn't specify the browser as a custom field, so I will choose, choose it. I'm actually going to do Firefox, save changing browsers. So I'll tell them what I'm using. And so I'm going to ignore my instruction, which is that I was using Chrome. So actual result was pretend I'm doing the application that passes, the next step passes, the next step passes, uh, next step passes, next step passes, looking good. I click on the submit button and oh no, it doesn't work. I get a 404 error. So let's go ahead and pretend we have a 404 error. To do that, I'm just going to fake it. Look, 404 error. I'm going to do a print screen on my keyboard or, uh, and then the PC you just do control V to paste it in on Mac it's I think it's Apple V I think uh, so let's go ahead and fail that test because it's got a 404 so oh, oh so you know oh no instead of submission working uh, got a missing page error instead that's not good I'll paste it in there it is and I hit the fail button now if I fail it that's going to fail the test case and that step but it's not going to log a defect to do the defect logging I have to go over here to the instant tab and it will warn me there's already two bugs logged against this step if they are the existing same functionality I can just link them in this case it's completely different so that's not appropriate so I will go in here and I'll put uh, missing 
page uh, when submitting book. Go away, password manager, choose a book. These types you would you'd want to synchronize with whatever tool you're using. If you're using Jira, if you're not using Jira, it's whatever's Inspira. We do support different customizable types like bug, change request, enhancement, issue, defect, uh, limitation, and so on. These are all customizable right here in the administration menu. Change these different types, priorities, and severities. Also, the instance got custom fields like difficulty and operating system and browser. Those are all things you can customize. And in fact, I'll bring them up over here to show you. These are the fields you see for the defect. These are all customizable. These are some examples that we have. Like we've made some required. And so the required ones are the ones that have the bold and the star. So I will at least go away, fill those out. It's my password manager being too eager. Um, so let me fill these out. There we go. And now I hit fail. And now it's failed my step and it's failed my test case. And in real life, I would move on to the next test case and keep testing. Maybe the next one I'm going to pass all because it, it worked fine. And the third one had an issue. But let's, before we do that, just to mention, there are some different views of testing. This is our split level view where you've got the test cases and steps on the left, the details on the right. You can navigate through that by clicking around. There's also a table view. People like the table view because you can see everything in a big scrolly list. If you're used to spreadsheets, it feels more like that. That's another op third option is mini view. That's what you'll see on a cell phone. If you're running on a cell phone or a tablet, it will default to mini view because you can do that. The third option with the mini view is you can also go in here. And, and if I want to have the actual application I was testing, if it allows it iframes, you can even test in here like that and put the results over here. That's really good if you're working from a single computer screen and you don't have the two physical monitors. You don't want to keep having to alt tab. It just saves a bit of time. So we like that. Uh, but that's how you run a test. Now that I've run the test, it's uh, finished. I'll just go ahead and finish what I'm doing. If we go back to the test screen and we go to the test results, we should see a test was logged. I'll just pick one that I ran today. Let's pick the first one because it failed. Failed ones are usually more interesting. You can see it's failed. It creates what's called a test run. That's the record of my results. That's the one I just did. If I click on it, you will see that I've got the um, name of it. The, uh, the set, the expected duration, the actual duration. You can see the steps I got through, almost all the steps, which is pretty good. I logged in with this user, used this URL. This is my test data. So it helps reproducing the issue. Um, and then the defect. So I click on the link. There's my screenshot. A bit small, so I can go full screen. Oh, yep, yeah, that's the issue. Go to the um, link for the defect. Click on that link. And that's going to take me to the defect that was logged. And if you're using Spira for your bug tracking, you will go in here and you would assign it directly in Spira to the test developer. Uh, hey, Fred. Hi, Fred. Please fix. And uh, fill in the other required fields so it doesn't prompt me for it because I know it will. You can customize which fields are required. Hit save. It's now, oh, priority. Forgot one. Hit hit save. And now it's going to go to the developer to look at that and fix it. The developer can also, as well as looking at the bug, they can look at the associations tab where they can see the results through the test run they can see the requirements it's based on to make sure the requirements make sense because maybe there's a disconnect between what was tested what was developed could it does happen um, they can also look at the attachments tab and obviously see the screenshot here as well uh, and that's how a developer would get the bug they would go in here and then if they were the, if they were the user they would go in here the workflow editor would be visible and they could fix it and then either it gets reopened if it's not fixed or it gets closed if it is fixed uh, and that's pretty much the defect side of things as well. We can go into more detail on that if there are questions on that. Um, one thing you can also do on this side, of course, is if it is a defect, you have the option of creating a new requirement from a defect to close the loop as well. So with that, we're about 40 minutes in. Um, I am just quickly going to reporting and then will be questions. So just a few more minutes uh, on the reporting dashboard that I came to earlier on. As I mentioned earlier, you've got graphs and charts. You've got the ability to have, first of all, various built-in graphs and charts that you see here, as well as that as an administrator, you can go down to the custom reporting section and you can create your own graphs and charts too. These are two examples I think we have in the demo. Yeah, so these are some examples of ones you, that we've created in the demo. Uh, we use a query language that's based on SQL, so it's very easy to build a query. You can display the data grid behind that query. This is basically a count of test status by a count of tests by status. Uh, you can also then get the graph of that too in the like donut donut form, which apparently in France is called uh, a camembert graph. I didn't know that. Uh, or you can have a bar chart or you can have a line chart. So you've got different graph options. And then when you when you as the admin create this graph, publish it, members of the team can then run that graph uh, from the reporting homepage. Same thing with the reports, but as well as doing the graphs, we do have the ability to create lots of nice documents and reports. And I'll just create the requirements 
traceability one to show you that. And then we'll go to questions. So let me create a requirements traceability report. I want it in PDF. I'll keep all the defaults, but you can filter by any of the standard or custom fields. You can uh, save the report configuration if you want to be able to reuse it and run it multiple times very quickly. You can also save the generated PDF and store that in our document repository for archiving or approvals. But I'm just going to run it right now. So let's run the report. And this is the PDF form. Uh, this is a traceability matrix. So it's showing my requirements. It's showing the type, the status, the tests that are linked to it. I'll scroll down. And it shows the reverse traceability from the uh, test cases back to the requirements. And again, we can do spreadsheets, we can do Excel reports, we can do Word, HTML, many, many different options. So that's an example of some of the reporting that we have. So with that, I'm now going to hand it back to Teresa to help moderate our questions. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, that was a whirlwind tour of uh, Spire Test, and we do have quite a few uh, questions. Um, so the first one uh, was asking, what version are you on? Um, I believe you're 7.4, but... But it's a great uh, question. Great question. I'm. This was a demo of Spire Test 7.4, correct, which is the current latest version that's available uh, for cloud and download customers. Uh, it's not Spire Team or Plan. Uh, we are coming out with Spire 7.5 in March. So we have about uh, almost every month, not quite every month cadence. So it's easy to get behind. If you are curious what's in a version, I will going to do a shout out for SpireDoc, our integrated and wonderful uh, documentation website. Go to about product roadmap shows you what's coming. Release the reason that shows you what's come. So you can see here 7.4, that's what's in 7.4, that's what's in 7.3. And if you want to see what's coming in the future, get a roadmap. Look at that. It's lots of things. Lots of fun stuff. Excellent. And and just a follow-up question too. Um, a, a, a question came across about baselining. Um, so you were talking about the difference between test and team and plan, um, but maybe speak to to the baselining functionality. Sure. Yeah, I can't show because it's not Inspire a test. But baselining lets you snapshot a project at different key points, and it will show you all the changes between those points. So Spire test has basic history tracking, got requirement, make changes. Uh, baselining, which is Inspire team or plan, would say between really end of release one and beginning of release one, what changed. It also tracks the association sorry, changes as well. So if a requirement was linked or unlinked from a test case, you will see those association changes in the history. But it shows you a nice aggregate list of all the changes that were made, not just artifact by artifact. So it's a bit more sophisticated, particularly for those doing more advanced requirements management, but it is across all artifacts. Excellent. Um, another question came in. You had mentioned uh, the ability to sync with other tools like um, Agile DevOps. So uh, for requirements, the question is, can we organize the tree by use case Epic, a few feature user story. So you can do that in Spire nat yeah, natively. It's a, a tree structure, and the tree structure is as many levels as you like, and you can organize that with different types. And previously on older versions, maybe the question came from this, the we would force the type of the parent to be a certain type that's gone away. So the, the parent type uh, like so if you have like so some people have like feature story sorry feature epic story you can have a three level hierarchy that's done that way if you want to have it be a different structure that's really up to you you can, you can have as many levels as you like and the different levels can have different types of requirement uh great um we have another question that came in about um how you might manage like a group of testers with inspira um so reassigning uh test uh, test cases to people. Can you just talk about that functionality? Adam? Sure, sure. Yeah, you, you you'll assign the test set to someone. There's a couple. So there's a couple of things actually. Let me close some tabs off. So first thing is, if you are if you're running a regression test and I want to assign it to a person and they're going to do that test and obviously things will change, but ideally they're going to run the whole thing. You would assign the test set like the owner field here to that person. If it's like an ERP system, like SAP, I guess there are cases where you want like the first test cases, create a purchase record, purchase re requisition. Second is approve it. Third one is do something else like the financials. Each person is an actor on that, that scenario. You can assign different owners here, here and here. So that way, you know, Amy does the first thing. Uh, Joe does the second part and Martha does the third and that way you're prescribing the actual testers so that's a second way of doing it but the other piece would be well let's say you've assigned the whole thing to uh, I guess it was Joe or Fred or even sysadmin but I, but that person is busy like I was doing a test and you know I, I ran two of the tests 
pass one and fail one and I'm doing this, this Q&A session, well, someone else could be doing this while I'm doing the Q&A. Well, how would I do that? Well, I go to reassign and I can reassign that to someone else. And I could do that, but so could the test manager from the, from the project homepage as well. Fantastic. Um, then we had a question that came across about uh, the custom graphs. Um, so the question is, can you make it uh, a custom graph be used only by the project on which you create it? So, uh, can you create, so the question was, can you create a graph only on the project in one project or is it, or, so I guess, let me see what I can do to answer that question. So first of all, when you create a graph, it's available in all projects uh, in the system that have access to, to, for a user that has access to that kind of data, like requirements data, for example. Um, in the graph itself, what you should do is when you limit the data, like here you can see there's this line where we have what's called the where clause. That's where you tell it which project am I reporting on. That's where you will specify dynamically the, the special dollar uh, squiggly bracket project ID. That says the current project, basically. So what you'll do by putting that into the query, what you're saying is create a query that limits the data to just the project that is currently being viewed on. Now, if you want to do a program level report graph, you do the same thing, but you would use the project group ID instead here. Oops, let me overwrite that like that, and you would change this to be that, and that's going to give you access to the entire group. If you were to remove this whole thing altogether, it's going to give you a system-wide view, so you can do system-wide, project-based, or pro project group, or program-based, as we call it. Uh, we don't yet have portfolio as an option, but that could be in the future. Uh, excellent. So that was the, the bulk of the questions. Um, I will add that uh, we got a shout out request for another lightning session that could be focused on add-ins that you kind of mentioned uh, some of the add-ins that uh, Spira has uh, to it. So I appreciate that feedback from uh, from some of our customers and, and colleagues. Um, but yes, no more questions. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Um, as Adam mentioned, um, if you like this content and you want to um, have it in person, we highly recommend you join us. Um, and in PletcherCon, we would love to see you there. Uh, it's April 19th through the 21st. Um, and then be looking out for more lightning sessions just like this one in the future. That's great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Teresa, for hosting it and moderating the questions. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope to see you at InfletraCon as well as Teresa mentioned and uh, and other writing talks uh, as they get scheduled. And we will use the feedback uh, on what you'd like to see to uh, help populate what's coming up next. So again, thanks so much and have a great rest of the week wherever you are in the world. Uh, and thanks for being uh, coming to this webinar today.